All right, uh, we have Arvind Prabhakar from uh, Cloudera. He's going to talk on Apache Flume. Thanks. Um, so, hey, everyone. Um, I'd appreciate if, uh, uh, you know, given the fact that this is between lunch and, and it's the last talk uh, for, for the morning. Um, I know it's going to be hard for you guys to focus, but I'll try my best to wrap it up on time. Um, so this talk is about planning um, your, your deployment of Apache Flume. Um, my name is Arvind Prabhakar. I um, am a PMC member and committer on a couple of Apache projects, uh, Scoop and Flume specifically. Both these projects uh, deal with data ingest. It's, 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 uh, it's a use case that's very uh, close to um, the effective utilization for systems like Hadoop. Um, I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and last but not the least, I'm an engineering manager at Cloudera. Um, what I have in this talk is um, basically two, two broad sections of, you know, my, my, my whole deck is divided into two broad sections. One section goes uh, through the overview of Flume. The other uh, goes through planning and sizing for your deployment. And um, the, the, the title of this talk is, is how you plan and size um, your, your topology and your deployment of Apache Flume. So I'd like to spend more time on that. Uh, but at the same time, I, I know that without having enough background, um, and not everybody may have an exposure to what Apache Flume is, uh, so I'd like to quickly go over the overview. Um, a quick show of hands, how many of you have actually heard or used Flume, or, you know, interacted with it? Okay, great, so, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll do the overview first. Um, so fundamentally, what Apache Flume is, is um, it's a system that's uh, designed to solve a data aggregation problem from streaming um, sources. Mm -hmm. So if you have trickle feed data coming in from various uh, different locations in, in your data center, uh, Flume is a system that will help you um, set up the ingest for that, you know, have it aggregated in a particular place uh, where you can then later run your analysis and such. So the, the, the big question is, you know, why would you need a system like Flume? And there, there, it, it seems to be a very commonplace occurrence in most data centers. You have log files that are scattered all over the place. You know, operators and administrators have figured out ways uh, to deal with, you know, how those log files are moved around. Um, so, so the big question is, why would you ever uh, want to have a dedicated system for that use case? Um, the answer is fairly straightforward. And if you have encountered this problem in your data center, you probably would identify with all of these points stated here. Um, the fact that you need something that's reliable and that, that scales out uh, is of paramount importance if you were to um, do a solution, you know, implement a solution in a sustainable way. Um, if your data aggregation problem is such that um, your operators and administrators keep getting um, called, um, you know, paged every every time there is a down node, uh, you have a problem at hand because you'd probably have to have an army of operators to go, you know, police that and, and, and make sure that keeps working. There's, there's other aspects of ad hoc solutions that don't quite work. Uh, for instance, um, you know, the complexity of the whole aggregation requirement, the complexity of the whole aggregation use case tends to only increase. It'll, it'll, it'll never be the case like, you know, our business is expanding and lo and behold, like, uh, you know, our data aggregation has simplified itself. It's not going to happen. Um, it will always go uh, towards the more complex end. And that's when you would realize that, you know, what started out as an innocent experiment with like maybe a dozen servers in, in, in a, you know, upcoming startup stage of your company um, quickly ran out of control and, and now you're faced with like hundreds and thousands of servers you know, all across maybe geographic boundaries, um, and you're scratching your head. So, so those are the kind of things, like, you know, if you have a batch of flume in, in a situation like this, you set it up and you forget about it. It's, it's, it's a system, if you plan and size correctly, will self-sustain. Um, it, it also has other advantages, like, for example, it has declarative uh, dynamic configuration, which basically translates to, you don't have to code to use it. Um, you, you would interact with the system through property configuration files. Um, and the system is able to take up those files as they change and readjust itself, retool itself. Um, you could have contextual routing. Contextual routing is, is um, sort of the equivalent of what if I have fire in that part of my data center? Um, you would want your traffic to be routed in a separate data center or, or, or something of that nature. Um, and then it has a 
ton of features. Not every feature is going to appeal to everyone, which is you know, obviously the case. The way Flume um, is designed is to deal with the majority use cases. Um, so it doesn't quite specialize in one specific area of the, the, uh, the aggregation problem. Um, you would find features that will enable you to do load balancing and failover and such, um, which may or may not be applicable in other use cases and so on. So over the next few slides, I'm going to go through these core concepts of what Flume is um, and you know, talk about how these concepts come together. So the, the first concept is, is that of an event. Um, this is the definition that you know, I think we have um, some consensus on. Uh, it's, it's important to note that, that you know, an event is uh, a, a very overloaded term. Uh, means different things in different uh, uh, contexts. Uh, in, in, in the context of Flume, what an event is, is basically um, this byte payload, an opaque payload that you're trying to send from one point to another. Um, so if you have, um, you know, for example, log files that are being generated by, you know, servers running in, in you know, thousands of nodes, um, Every entry in that log file could qualify as an event, um, or it could be something totally different. Uh, it entirely depends upon what your use case is, what you're trying to aggregate, where you're trying to take it. Um, and then you basically define, here are my events. And, and Flume as, as a system comes with ways by, which help you figure that out. Um, but once you have this event, Flume will be able to take it and route it to its destination. And all across this routing, uh, Flume doesn't care much about what exactly that event contains. Um, it could be, you know, just any random set of bytes for, for all Flume cares. It doesn't have to be fixed size. It could be variable size uh, byte payload. Uh, what Flume does care about is optional headers, uh, which can be applied to this event. And the concept is, is inspired from, you know, how SMTP routing works, where you have, like, string, you know, key value pairs that, that, that carry the envelope information for your payload. Um, and similar information can be added to the headers in Flume. And then once, once it's in, um, you can configure Flume to react to presence of certain headers and thus you know, maybe achieve contextual routing. Um, and you can manipulate these headers as, as the event is trickling down. All events, they start at the client place. So, so, so client is the point of origination of events. Um, in, in, in the case of you know, hundreds of web servers or hundreds of servers in, in your data center generating logs, you'd probably have a client uh, in those nodes. And then you would send, uh, uh, you, you, the, the client would then parse out the logs, take out the events from the logs, and start routing them, pumping them into the Flume pipelines. Um, there are out-of-the-box clients. There's the log for JPender. There, there are, you know, um, you know, there, there's a, a very, very simple to use API, um, which runs with minimal configuration. Um, and, and you basically take it, um, you can write your own client using that API. And the impact it has on, on your overall solution is that it decouples your aggregation um, complexity from your, your application that is, that is using the client. Um, if you were to, for example, have your application directly write data into, say, an edge base um, cluster, uh, the kind of problems you'll be facing are quite different from the kind of problems you'll face when, you know, A, you have a simple client that's, that's fairly straightforward. You have a sized and planned topology of how that aggregation flow trickles into edge base, and then Flume kind of takes over and makes sure that it correctly deposits itself. Uh, clients are not necessarily needed in all cases, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but so you have the point of origination as uh, the client, and what the client does is it sends data into agents, and there's a set of agents, you know, one behind the other, forming a pipeline. Um, an agent, you know, um, is basically a container which runs all of the Flume components, and we'll talk about these components. The, the first component that comes in the pipeline is a source. Um, so what a source is is essentially a, a, a component that, that receives events from the upstream. So you, you know, if your clients are running in your server nodes, um, they would be using some IPC mechanism to send those events over to an agent, the agent that it's configured with. And there would be a source operating within the agent, 
um, that will receive that event. Um, so there, there are a couple of I, IPC sources uh, that Flume comes with. One is Arrow. Thrift is um, um, not yet in any of the upstream releases. Uh, it should be in the next release, uh, but the, the work is almost done. Um, and what the source does is, it, it, you know, it says here it requires at least one channel to function, but basically channel is a buffer uh, that the source writes to. So the source will take that event, put it in the channel. So there are different types of channels that Flume comes with. And you know, again, all of these components are basically interfaces, and there's, there's a rich framework that you could extend, write your own channels if you wanted to. But essentially what a channel is, is, is a transactional queue, um, a double-ended transactional queue. So you have sources writing into the tail of this queue using transactional semantics and, and sinks which are draining this queue. And this gives you this classic producer-consumer model where uh, you have the channels as the buffer and the sources as the producers and sinks as the consumers. Um, the, the, the point to note here is the channels themselves are passive. They're not doing any data transfer. They essentially rely on um, the, the fact that the sources are actively dumping information into the channel and sinks are actively draining the channel. And we'll talk about sync, but you know, um, just, just for completeness, um, there, there, there could be IPC sinks or there could be terminal sinks. Terminal sinks are sinks which will take event data out of the Flume pipeline and deposit it in its destination. So, so the most popular terminal sink uh, that we encounter is um, HDFS sync and HBase sync. Um, there are people in the community who have gone and written things for other systems as well, um, and I think most of them are available on GitHub and, and, and maybe even as patches. Um, but if you have an elongated pipeline, um, the sync to source communication would be the I IPC communication. So you have the Avro source, um, Av Avro sync on one agent talking to the Avro source on another agent. Um, some secondary concepts, uh, there's this notion of interceptor. This is, um, this is a simple extension point that you can use uh, to introspect, inspect events and, and you know, drop them, filter them, maybe even modify them, although you know, that not necessarily Flume is not the best system for modifying events as they go along. Uh, but filtering, uh, maybe routing, uh, those kind of things. You could, you could inspect the event and apply headers based on their priorities, whatever that, that, that information that matters to your use case. Um, there's some out-of-the-box interceptors. Um, there's, there's the timestamp interceptor and the hostname interceptor and, and the static header interceptor. So, for example, you know, this, this all kind of works very well across, you know, different components. For example, the timestamp interceptor will, will apply the, the UDC timestamp on, on top of an event, and then you can use that timestamp um, and specific parts of it, like the hour, the day, the year, the month, and so on, um, to be used as a path delimiter um, in your destination location in HDFS. Or, uh, you know, if you have your own serializers, you could use that information for doing anything else for that matter. But out of the box, it's fairly flexible how these interceptors can affect where your destination is. Um, you also have channel selectors. Uh, what channel selectors do is, is when, you know, a source is configured with multiple channels, a channel selector can then um, decide which channel must a batch of event that just freshly arrived would go to. Um, doing this allows you to effectively uh, have, have custom routing logic if you want to write. Um, there, there, there are things uh, that, there are a couple of channel selectors that come out of the box. There's the replicating channel selector and the multiplexing channel selector. What replicating does is copies your event data over, so it's kind of a fan out flow. Um, and the multiplexing selector allows you to make conditional hops so, for example, you can say, if my event, bat, event data has a certain header, I want it to go to that channel, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, finally, you know, sync processor uh, is basically uh, an, an element that works with multiple syncs, and it's capable of implementing complex logic such as failover and load balancing and such. All of this is software logic, so, so you know, there is no requirement for you to go, you know, have like a dedicated uh, uh, load balancer installed in your pipeline, you can, you can actually code this up through configuration. Um, so there, there's the built-in load balancing sync processor which allows you to have random or round robin out of the box uh, mechanisms and, and then you can uh, implement your own selection mechanism uh, across different syncs and then you have failover and the default. So this is how 
an agent uh, takes in data. What you see, you know, the little blue arrow, if you can see it, um, is, is hypothetical data coming into your agent. Um, and the source receives it. It, um, it. it talks to this gray out component called the channel processor, which is grayed out because that's a framework component in Flume. It's not replaceable. Everything else is replaceable in this diagram. You could write your own sources, you could write your own interceptors, you could write your own channel selectors and your own channels. Um, but that said, you know, the channel processor, uh, what it does is it, uh, it applies um, the configured interceptors on top of these sources. Um, and then once, once these interceptors pass, like they allow these events to proceed down the ingest pipeline, the channel processor would then invoke the configured selector to identify the set of channels that this event information needs to go to. Um, similarly, on the other side, you have like the agent draining of this information. So you have a sync processor, which uh, again is a framework component, it's not replaceable, but uh, I'm sorry, the sync runner, which identifies the sync processor to use. And, and the sync processor then figures out which set of syncs uh, need to be invoked. And those syncs automatically drain the channels that they are configured with. So, this is a schematic of how you, you can think of the, the pipeline, the flow in Flume working. Um, you know, the, the top uh, diagram is, you know, a healthy flow where you have data coming in into, you know, first agent and it, it, it dips into the, the channel, the channel starts buffering the data and then there is a sink which is draining that data out. Um, so in, in a steady state, you, your channel sizes, you know, the, the metaphoric like liquid inside this little drum, um, will be at a minimal level. Uh, you'd be, you know, draining it as it comes along. And that's the effect of, that's the reason why you want to plan because you want to make sure that your pipelines behave um, in a predictable manner. Oops. Um, so anyway, but, but, but the, the, the point, the fact is that there will be failures, there'll be network congestion, there will be like, you know, people tripping over wires and such. When that happens um, and a communication link is lost, what Flume does is it, it starts using the channel buffers to absorb that shock, to absorb that failure. Um, and it will keep buffering. So in this particular diagram, you know, the, the, the communication to the last agent is lost. So the second agent uh, starts buffering up all the data that comes its way. Um, and if, if the link is restored, you know, it'll drain back again and, and, and the system will come back to an equilibrium steady state again. Uh, but if it doesn't, eventually this channel will fill up. And when this channel fills up, it'll fail itself that agent will stop accepting any data. And that's when the first agent in this pipeline will start buffering things up. Um, so, you, you know, the longer you have the pipeline, uh, the better is your ability to, you know, sort of retain uh, so much information across, um, you know, from downstream failures. The, the part of, of the system that actually makes it really important to uh, notice is, is that the exchange between agents of, of of event data, of the event badges, is transactional. Which basically means that your data is not going to be lost regardless of any of these failures. An agent will not let go of your event data unless it gets a, a confirmed uh, commit, a transactional commit from the other agent that's accepting this data. So if you look at this particular diagram, the, the, the blue channel and the blue sink um, are the upstream agent and the, I guess, pink or violet, whatever that is, source and channel, it's the downstream. So the upstream agent starts the transaction, the sync in the upstream agent's trans transaction, um, removes a batch of events, sends it across over the network to the source in the downstream agent, which then starts its own transaction, commits it to the channel, ends the transaction. Um, and that's when the upstream sync commits its own transactions. So if, if there's anything that goes wrong in this picture, you know, network failure, disk full, channel capacity exhausted, that transaction, the downstream transaction will fail, if the downstream transaction fails, the upstream transaction will fail, your data doesn't go anywhere. Uh, so that hop is, is a guaranteed transactional exchange. So this basically ends up, you know, forming the, the backbone or how the system, how the pipelines work. Um, so with that, I'm gonna shift gears, focus on how do you plan and size your deployment. So, we talked about aggregation use case. Um, 
And, and I think I mentioned in the passing what the ad hoc solutions could be. So here's, here's an example of you've got three web servers, you're an you know, upcoming startup, you, you launched your thing, um, and you, know, you have this little cluster deployed somewhere. You'd like to do machine learning or like data mining, whatever you want to do in the logs. Here's your use case. You've got you know, three servers, and you can code up like you know, maybe shell scripts to do it. But if you were to actually use a Flume agent, uh, it gives you many advantages. One, if your cluster has any downtime, uh, you don't have to fill up the disks on, on the servers. So that, that's an important nice insulating factor. Um, it also allows you to quickly offset things, uh, offload the data into the Flume agent. And you, know, you, you would not run up uh, into a situation where the disks on your web servers are filling up. So if out of these three web servers, one of them is the most popular because of a bug in your load balancing mechanism, um, you know, chances are um, Flume will be able to scale specifically to consume the excessive load coming in from that one place um, and, and provide you uh, that, that shock absorbing capacity. So this is the part that you know, it's, it's very characteristic, of, characteristic of, of how Flume operates in that it's designed to deal with the impedance mismatch between the upstream and the downstream. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you also make sure that you're, you're utilizing your network in, in, in a more effective way um, if you go with Flume. Um, so that was just with one Flume agent. If you were to add another Flume agent, now you have more capacity. You, you have redundancy. Um, you'd be able to fail over in case this particular Flume agent is, is, you know, has filled up its own channels and the downstream is not available. So now you've got two places where you could go. And, and you could you know, layer them one after the other, too. It's, it's a matter of like, making the right choices, which matter to your uh, uh, particular use case. Um, you could also route things. You know, if you go from three servers to 30 servers, and now you have a problem where like, there's parts of your application that deal with you know, one class of users, and another part of the application deals with another class of users, you could, you could through routing uh, across Flume pipelines, you, you could address where they need to go. So a typical converging flow is what that you know, use case comes down to. And, and this is sort of a general high level uh, view of how um, you, know, you would lay things out. You have any number of clients uh, talking to any number of agents which talk to more and more agents. Um, and eventually, the last agent set will deliver it to the destination. Um, so these agents, these, these agent areas are, are you know, informally called tiers, right? Um, you, would, you would basically um, have an outer tier of, of agents, you know, which is dealing directly with the clients. And as these tiers converge, the number of agents will reduce. And as these number of agents are reducing, you know, their capacity keeps going up and up. So, so a, a typical schematic is this. So you have like, you know, once you're like, Fortune 500 company after your startup experience, you have this huge number of, 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 of outermost tier agents. And there are a lot of clients writing to those agents. And then they converge, they aggregate into second tier, and the second tier aggregates into third tier. Um, well, we'll talk about you know, why would you want to even do this, uh, but it, suffice to say that, that, that you know, this is not the only way it can be done. There, there, there are many different ways. I, I just picked one use case and, and went after that to set an example. So the event volume in these tiers is different. Your outermost tiers, like the hundreds of nodes, the hundreds of agents that are running closest to where the data is being produced from, uh, will see the minimal um, data volume, the event volume flow. And as it goes into the aggregation tiers, the amount of data that the aggregation tier is dealing with goes up a little bit, and then up and up, eventually you know, leading to the terminal tier. But you know, if you do the math, they all add up. So all the data that is being produced at the outermost tier is exactly constant you know, across all the tiers, because all of this data is going. It's just a matter of how many agents is it divided into. Um, and that's basically the basis. Uh, that's, that's the fundamental uh, premise on how you would plan and size your deployments. Like, you, you, you know, you want to strive for the steady state. So the topology planning um, has these things to be considered. One, number of points of origination of events, like the number of your end, end data nodes or whatever, you know, web servers and such. Um, where do they actually want, where do you actually want to send these events to? 
these two given factors, what you need to find out through your topology and, 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 and deployment planning is how can you cushion the spike of load that happen on your peripheral tiers um, and make sure that you know, you're not bringing down your production systems, your SDFS or whatever by having this like 9 a.m. spike that happens because everybody opens up their browsers. Um, and also, what kind of maintenance downtimes are you going to need? You know, how do you project that and, and how you can actually plan for it so that Flume continues to operate while your downstream systems are not available. So identifying the number of tiers, um, you know, we, we, I briefly talked about it, like each of these tiers are aggregating more and more information. Um, you could add specific logic in these tiers for handling load balancing and failovers, um, uh, you know, if you will. Uh, that's, that's a very typical use case we see in the field very often. Um, and then also realize that the, the more volume of, of data that each of these agents in different tiers handle, the, the, you, you're utilizing the network better and you're utilizing the I.O. capacity of your systems better. Um, as an example, you know, file channel, which provides persistence of your events you know, while, while they exist on, on, on the pipeline in their transient state, uh, heavily relies on F-syncs, disk level F-syncs, um, in order to provide transactional guarantees. So if you have a larger batch size that goes into the file channel, you have less F-syncs. So here's a rule of thumb. Um, you know, when you're sizing your, your topology, when you're planning your topology, you, you want to take the outermost um, number of, of client, you know, points of origin, and then apply a ratio like this, like 4 to 16. It doesn't have to be just 4 to 16. Um, in some cases, it, 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 there are the many factors that affect this. Like if, if your servers are generating like a few kilobytes per minute, you know, it's not much, um, you know, maybe, maybe a few kilobytes per hour, you, you probably can do with um, having a ratio of 100 to 1. But if your, your servers are producing a large volume, like, you know, a few megabytes a minute, that's when, you know, you need to figure out whether 4 to 16 kind of makes sense for you. So I'm, I'm just going to work with that number. And that's on an average case of what you see from tier to tier, uh, uh, you know, uh, ratio in, in, in a typical aggregation flow. The kind of factors you will fold in into that planning is whether you want load balancing, whether you want failover, and if there's any contextual rounding. And I'm not going to explore in detail what these things mean. Um, I would suggest if you ever try this um, by yourself, please go ahead and, and disregard these factors and, and, and form your topology, uh, lay that out, see how that works, and then do a secondary analysis to see how you can do failover and load balancing on top of it. Um, but basically, um, using this rule of thumb, you know, uh, let's say starting with, with, with an example of 100 web servers, bumping in into, say, a destination HDFS uh, cluster, and, and using the 1 is to 16 ratio for the outer tier, you would, you would basically get about 7 tier 1 agents. And then there are 7 tier 1 agents, you know, you reduce this ratio for the next tier, bring it to 1 to 4, uh, you would basically get 2 tier 2 agents. And that's basically your topology for this use case. So on, on the diagram, it kind of looks like this. You have 16 web servers writing to the first agent. Uh, agent 1 is all the agents in, in, in the same tier, in the tier 1, which then sends uh, the aggregated information to agent two. Now this kind of um, exposes a, a, a real, uh, uh, you know, configuration uh, requirement here, which is in steady state, all of that information that is coming into say agent one should be exiting that agent one at the same state, at the same rate, in, in order for you to have equilibrium, in, in order for you to have steady state, uh, which basically translates to what we call the batch size. On, on the sinks. So your sources work with the upstream batch size. You know, whatever the client batch size is, doesn't matter. Whatever is coming in, is coming in. But assuming, you know, the clients, for, for the sake of argument, are sending um, maybe 100 events per cycle. And the cycle could be like one send, one network call. Uh, so if they're sending 100 events per cycle, and there's 16, you know, clients writing to that agent, you got 1,600 events per cycle coming in. That should be the batch size for your exiting node. So, so when agent one writes to agent two in that previous diagram, the batch size it uses 1,600. So in one cycle, all the events that came into that agent have exited the agent. And 
the, again, fundamental requirement for you to, to plan your steady state. Um, if the batch size, you know, if the total ingest rate is way more than 2,500, uh, yes, you, you have to break it down to multiple sinks and they just add up. And then similarly, you could do the sink batch size for, um, you know, the agent too. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, so I have to rush this. Um, the, the next thing is you want to make sure uh, you have enough failure tolerance capacity. So your file channel or your memory channel, whatever channels you're using, it should have enough capacity to hold on to um, all these, these uh, uh, event batches that are coming in in case of downstream failures. And, and you, you would basically do a very simple back of the envelope calculation, figure out if this is my expected worst case rate um, and I need to be down for two hours, how many events must I store in the channel? And, and that gives you the channel size. Um, if it's a file channel, we encourage that you, you, know, you use multiple different spindles. Uh, that increases the throughput of the file channel. Um, so here's, here's a, a, a graph of how the channel capacity changes you know, in cases of production and you have downstream failures. Um, so the first part, uh, you, know, you would see the channel size um, sort of fluctuating up and down, up and down. It's pretty normal, pretty healthy. Um, the, the important thing is that it keeps coming down, it, got, it keeps coming to like close to zero, and that's great. Uh, but then if you, the moment you have a downstream failure, the channel starts backing up, and it'll back up to the point where it hits its capacity. And this is the window, you know, from the steady state to the uh, hitting of its capacity limit. That's the window you plan for. And if in that window you can address any downstream failures, that's cool, because then the system will come back to normal. But in this particular graph, that planning was done in such a way that, you know, um, the, the failure was, took much longer to restore itself. So that's why you see that plateau on the top, which is the channel is full. And when the channel is full, this agent has failed. Uh, but then if the downstream agent becomes available again, you know, the communication is restored and the channel starts draining up again. Lastly, um, the way you would size your hardware is, again, starting with the rule of thumb that uh, the number of cores uh, that you need on the agent box uh, is equal to half of the total number of sources and things combined. Now, sources are multi-threaded by nature, by default. They, they, they are designed in a way that they will scale up um, to any capacity that, capacity that they need to, whereas things are single-threaded. And that's why, you know, the idea of using multiple things in case the batch sizes are large. Um, and the reason is that one, one, one major aspect of, I think I mentioned this in the passing earlier, one major aspect is the impedance mismatch. You know, you have like huge spike of load happening on your peripheral tiers. You don't want that to be, that jolt to be translated directly on your production edge base or whatever that is. Um, so when, when you started with this rule of thumb, you're able to, you know, you might think, oh, this is kind of wasteful because I'm like, I'm having too much computation capacity and not quite effectively utilizing it. Uh, that's not entirely true, depending upon which part of your pipeline you're in. Um, obviously, if you're using the memory channel, there are special requirements. Um, you know, if you're using the file channel, the special requirements, you must have enough space um, on either in the memory or on the disk to keep all of that data. Um, so the most important thing in Flume deployment is stage testing. Regardless, all of what I've described here are just based on empirical, you know, evidence that we've gathered from the field. Um, every deployment is different. Every use case is different. Um, every characteristic of, you know, every flow that Flume has ever touched is different. There, I cannot emphasize enough the need for you to do this. Uh, you must ensure that you project, you know, A, be grounded in your projections. Like, yes, I want my business to grow 100 times in this year, but that's not what I would plan for. Like, 100 times capacity is not needed. That would be really, really wasteful. Uh, but that said, you know, if, if I project my business to go like 5%, um, that's, that's a reasonable projection. And, and yes, I will plan for that extra 5%, and I'll make sure that all my, you know, sizing and topology planning is done with that in mind. And when I start seeing that it's about to hit that limit, I will revisit this and expand the pipelines, expand the, 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 the convergent flows. Um, but it's extremely important that you make these projections and these be grounded projections and, and be able to test them out, make sure this, this planned topology um, deployment um, meets those requirements. And, you know, once, once you 
move it into production, don't just let that go. I mean, you'd have to monitor it for a little while before it stabilizes and you are comfortable with and you understand what your flow characteristics are. Um, and once you're un, you know, at that point where you understand what your flow characteristics are and, and you, you, you have done enough testing to ensure that this topology, this, this deployment is capable of handling it, it kind of runs itself. Um, and you know, until, of course, the time when your load becomes much more and you know, for whatever reasons, uh, um, you need to go revisit this topology. Um, if you have any questions, any, any need for like any clarifications or, or you're running into any problems during any of this, do not hesitate to ping us. Um, it's a very active community, uh, the Apache Flum community. Uh, we, we take pride in the fact that we've seen lot, lots of deployments in, in, in a very, er, very early stage of our, our you know, completely um, ground up implementation of Flume, what is now Flume 1.x. It's the latest version 1.3.0. Uh, strongly encourage you to go try it out, and if there's anything, uh, please let us know. So that's about it uh, from my side. Open to questions. Yeah. You can have the mic. I'm trying, to, trying to understand the concepts. It seems that the really, really time sensitive thing is getting from the source to the very first tier uh, agent. And then the subsequent tiers, I would think, are not as time sensitive. Can you kind of fill me in what, how, if I'm thinking about this sort of the right way, it seems like everything is happening synchronously. No. So every agent, you know, there, there are two active components in an agent. The source is active on its own. The sync is active on its own. The channel acts as a buffer. So they're basically asynchronous. This whole pipeline is hop-to-hop -hop asynchronous transfer. Now. If you want to keep it as close to real time as you want, you need to plan very carefully to make sure that there are no interruptions in this flow. You know, you have enough capacity, you have enough hardware capacity for the kind of projected flow volume that, that you're expecting. And once you do that, you can keep the end-to-end -end delivery times minimal. But if any time there is a failure in the system, the channels will back up. And it's only when that failure is restored that, that the channels will start draining again, and that will in, introduce latency. Um, that's just how the system is. Yeah. So I have two questions. Uh, first question is, can we deploy Flume in such a way that your tier two and tier three are in separate data centers and geographically like far? So say tier two is in London and tier three is in California. Um, so typically, um, it, Yes, the question was, can you deploy Flume in such a way that different tiers are in different geographical locations, uh, or maybe different, different data centers altogether? Um, the answer is yes, um, although uh, you, you definitely want to ensure that the communication links between those tiers that span geographical boundaries or data center boundaries are minimal. So you probably want to have a lot of aggregation happen right within your first set of tiers before it gets piped over to the next. And the second question is, uh, do you have checksumming and uh, you know uh, compression in between? There is a JIRA for checksum interceptor. Uh, but that said, the exchange, in, um, the exchange for event data is transactional. So we guarantee no data loss. But at the same time, you know, at the file channel level, uh, there's work that's being done uh, to, to safeguard against bit rot, for example, if, if, if the data were to sit there for a long time. So two questions. Is there an S3 sync? Um, the question is, is there an S3 sync? Uh, well, so S3 works very well uh, with, uh, you know, as, as one of the file systems on HDFS. So you could technically assume that you know, the, the HDFS sync will be capable of writing to um, a, you know, the DFS back by S3. Okay. Um, but there is an open Jira, and we, we, we uh, like patches. OK. Um, and second question was, so I know there was an old Flume uh, project, and there's a new generation uh, Flume project, next generation. What is the difference between those two? What was it necessary to actually have Flume NG? 
Okay, cool. So, so for, for those who may not be up to date on the history of the project, uh, a quick recap. Flume uh, was developed at Cloudera, uh, and it, it went through multiple releases, uh, I believe, three years ago. And at, at some point in time, I think a year and a half ago, we, we decided to move it to incubation in, in Apache. That's when uh, Flume came into the incubator, and close to a year later, it graduated. Um, the code base that came into Apache was uh, that of Flume 0.9x. Uh, which is also referred to as Flume OG. Um, but then, you know, over the course of these multiple releases that we saw through Cloudera's uh, experience in the field, uh, we realized that quite a few assumptions and, and design changes necessary in order to address the kind of requirements that Flume was being subject to in the field. So we did a complete rewrite, and that rewrite became what was called Flume NG. That was the first release we made through Apache. Uh, the Flume 1.0 was the first release. The 0.9 was never released through Apache. It's a Cloudera product. You've, I mean, it's still there. You can try it out. Um, our active development is entirely based on Flume 1.x line, and uh, that has seen deployment in, in many, many um, uh, uh, consumer sites. All right, so no more questions. I have one, uh, uh, you know, uh, a plug to highlight, which is HBaseCon happening in, um, on June 13, I believe. Call for papers is open. Please uh, share your experiences with HBase. Um, I'm actually looking forward to one of um, our committers talk about um, how Flume plugs into HBase, and, and it's something that a lot of our customers are using for real-time analysis. Um, so hope to see you all there as well. And there's also a scoop talk uh, with Kathleen and myself today in this room. I think it's at 4.15. Um, and we'll have a demo. It'll be a little bit more, uh, you know, risky because demos hardly ever work. But we'll try it, right? See, see you guys later. Thank you very much.